It's a funny place to be, stuck in a seemingly mundane world with an inner knowing that the universe is so much more than our mortal minds can comprehend. Yet we all have the capacity to know peace and our oneness with the wholeness of life. And through these interviews, discussions, and reflections, it is my intention to share this possibility. I'm Ryan Kurzak, and this is the Kriya Yoga Podcast. Three, two, one. So welcome everybody back to the Kriya Yoga podcast. I'm here with another very special guest, um, dear spiritual friend of mine, Chris Sartain, who's also a student of Roy Eugene Davis. Uh, he has been ordained by Mr. Davis and authorized to teach Kriya Yoga. Uh, he's originally from the U.S., but moved to Chile about six years ago, and he runs a yoga school there with his wife, and the name of that school is Vinyasa Yoga Chile. And this is located in Patagonia, Southern Chile. Uh, Chris, along with being a yoga school administrator and teacher, Kriya Yoga practitioner, he's also an author and he's written several books. One of them being The Sacred Science of Yoga and the Five Koshas, another Spiritually Mature Yoga, and his most recent publication, as close to 2019 as possible, is Kriya Yoga Realizations. So today, um, we're going to be talking about particular sutras from the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and how they relate to our spiritual practice and how they can help us to um, grow more inwardly, more profoundly into self-realization. So thank you for being here with me today, Chris. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, Ryan. It's great to uh, be with you. Yeah, so you've been down in Chile for about six years now, right? Yes, that's, uh, that's about right. Five and a half years, six years, something like that. And how long have you had the yoga school running down there? We've been offering yoga teacher trainings for about four years, although we had the school previously in Atlanta right. for several years and also in Colorado where we lived for a couple of years before moving here. And we've been operating here for about four years and we uh, offer 200 hour and 500 hour yoga teacher trainings all over Chile and various different parts of Chile and also Argentina. And we also uh, recently I don't want to say finished construction because it's really a work in progress, but we have a yoga and meditation retreat center in Southern Chile in the Patagonia region that we also run now. Well, I remember the video. I don't know if you sent it around or if you sent it to me or if I just stumbled upon it, but you gave a video tour of the area you're in. It looked like you're by a volcano. How far away is that? Far enough to create enough fear to keep you honest, you know, uh, it's a, it's about 30 miles. It looks closer than it actually is. It's like the rear view mirror effect, you know, right. But uh, yeah, it's about 30 miles away. So it is active. Um, people don't really, I mean, I've, I've seen it erupt. I've seen lava spew, spew out of it from our, wow. Wow. from our vantage point at our property, but it, it's not, it's not dangerous, but it is, it is active. Uh, we're surrounded by volcanoes there. It's a very um, active area as far as, um, you know, geothermal activity. Because of that, there are a plethora of hot springs. We probably have about 30 hot springs within an hour's drive of where we are. We have one very close that we can walk to. All right. Um, it's just amazing. So if uh, people enjoy hot springs, it's a, uh, kind of a hot spring paradise there. Well, it looks like a really beautiful area. So I, I, you've got the yoga school going and um, what is the, uh, w what is it like there in regards to interest in, in meditation? Is that growing there? Is it prevalent? What, what's, what's it like in, in your area? Mm, that's a good question. It's interesting, you know, in the United States, well, of course, Yogananda arrived in 1920 and we can sort of pinpoint that year as sort of the beginning of interest in meditation and yoga in the United States. But here in Chile, gosh, it probably 
only has about 30 years since maybe 1990-ish, I want to say. Um, so it's something relatively new here. Right. Still. And so interest has been increasing recently, but people still don't have a very good grasp of what meditation is. Well, gosh, this we could probably say the same in most countries. Right. But here meditation is still associated with relaxation mm -hmm. exercises or guided visualizations or maybe breathing techniques or um, affirmations or sound therapy, sound healing, sound meditations, that sort of thing. So it, it's difficult for me to explain to people that none of that is actually meditation. Um, and that, that's been hard for me, the most difficult challenge I've faced is educating people about what meditation really is and, um, and that it's not a technique or a set of techniques. Um, but anyway, so, so, there, so there's you're, growing you're, interest here. Yeah, so you're helping to lead the charge in the Southern Hemisphere. Well, there's a lot of us. <laughs> yeah, well, that's there's good. There's a lot of people. Yeah, there's a lot of people that are teaching meditation. We have Buddhist, uh, Tibetan Buddhist groups here, Zen Buddhist groups from Japan also in Chile, and a good number of yogis that have studied in India and have studied with uh, some of the great masters. Not, not many, but there's a few of us here that are, I guess you could say, leading the charge. Um, right. But certainly interest has, has been increasing steadily, I think, over the years. But again, it's something relatively new here. And um, it's a very Catholic country. So it's uh -huh. a very sort of conservative Catholic country. And uh, that's been interesting to navigate as well. Right, right. Well, you know, considering that, um, discussing the idea of what meditation is, um, in one of the sutras or t two of the sutras that y you picked, um, you know, when we were talking about doing this podcast, I said, well, let's think about six sutras from yoga sutras that could really help people understand what this was all about. And the first one, which is at the very beginning of the yoga sutras, yoga, chitta, vritti, naroda, um, that in a nutshell encompasses the whole process. Uh, so can you describe that to us, what your understanding of that is, and, and how, how an understanding of that particular sutra can help people recognize what true meditation is? Sure. Um, perhaps it would be useful to define each term separately, and then I'll give sort of a synopsis of, of what the entire verse means. Yeah. So in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, yoga and samadhi are synonymous, so they have the same meaning and both roughly mean union or divine union or um, union with the individual union of the individual consciousness with the supreme consciousness something like that chitta is typically translated as mind however i am not not too crazy about that translation i'll return to that in a second mm -hmm. vritti uh, has various translations, fluctuations, movements, vibrations, um, which I like, all of those. However, when we, were, when we are meditating, when we are in the act of meditation, vrittis are distractions. Mm -hmm. okay? And then narodha means to cease or to stop or to pacify. So chitta is a little bit problematic. Um, because in my experience with meditation, it is possible to, to have vrittis or to experience vrittis that are not exclusively mental. Right. In other words, if my shoulder hurts or my back is sore or I have a little bit of a headache or something like that, these are physical vrittis that I'm experiencing. Likewise, if I experience emotions or energies these can also be distractions and these are not mental distractions mm -hmm. these are happening in my pranamaya kosha or my energetic layer so when we talk about chitta i prefer to say that the chitta is our entire being All right so in other words um 
and, and other people have, have translated it as the field of awareness, which is also pretty good, but it's still somewhat lacking. So I, I prefer to think of chitta as our entire being, all five layers of our being. You mentioned earlier that uh, one of my books is about the five koshas. And so I'm always thinking in terms of the koshas and the five, kosha means layer um, or sheath. Right. And they, these are five layers that cover up our Atman or soul. And so I think of the chitta as encompassing all five of those uh, layers. So in other words, yoga chitta vritti narodha altogether basically means yoga or samadhi happens or occurs when there are no fluctuations or movements or vibrations or distractions in our being. Mm -hmm. And I, I always like to add a word to this definition. I like to say yoga or samadhi can occur <laughs> when there are no fluctuations in our being. In, in other words, in my experience, there's no guarantee of this experience of samadhi or divine union. There is an element of grace from the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, that needs to also occur mm -hmm. in order for us to have this deep and profound experience of divine union and oneness, oneness consciousness. So in other words, it, in my experience, it is a combination of our own meditative efforts, but also with a little sprinkling of, of, of divine grace. Right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue with that, but two points I'm, I'm curious about to clarify is, um, so when, when you're describing uh, chitta as being, well, our being, um, mm -hmm. And again, you, you're, you're probably implying this, I don't know, but for the people who are listening, um, is that if we're looking at as the five layers, these are the layers where experience, is, is, is it the, the level of being where experience occurs? Because it, like our whole being, there's actually, you know, that part of us which, you know, is not bound by uh, experience or something that can be defined. So when you're using that word chitta, is that how, you, how you're considering it? Yeah, great question. So we say that the koshas, and, and it's interesting that each kosha, anamaya, kosha, pranamaya, manamaya, vignanamaya, nandamaya, all end in the word maya. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> yeah. which, which means illusion. Uh -huh. And it, it is vibratory. So all five of the koshas vibrate, and they're vibratory phenomenon. And so the Atman or the soul does not vibrate. It has no vibration. And so it just observes and, and tranquil, perfect peace. Right. And so, yes, to answer your question, yes, the chitta is the observable is the observable. Yeah. The experiential um, part of our being. And so, you know, if you look at um, sort of the philosophy of qualified, Advaita Vedanta, there's this notion that there is oneness, but this oneness has two <laughs> uh, parts, which, right. you know, mentally, intellectually, we, it's impossible to comprehend. How can one thing have two? <laughs> right. but, but essentially, there is the part of God that uh, does not vibrate, which is known as Shiva, and the part of God that does vibrate, the feminine aspect, which is known as Shakti. Mm -hmm. But so Chitta, we, we could say, is, is the Shakti, the, the part of us that vibrates, that is comprised of five koshas. And so mm -hmm. when we calm and pacify these vibrations that are constantly occurring in our being, we have a much better opportunity to experience that part of, what, of us which does not vibrate. Right. Which is the right. soul, the Atman, the divine. Mm -hmm. And the, the other aspect uh, that, that you were discussing about this idea of um, you can experience, you, you can experience this oneness when these things are calmed or, or, or pacified or not vibrating anymore. Um, and the only thing that, that that makes me wonder about is, you know, many people have an idea of what, a oneness experience is like. And so I, I completely agree that, that there is an aspect of it where uh, grace is necessary and, you know, we can't control it. We can't force it to happen. But then I wonder at times, 
if someone is sitting in meditation and everything is still and calm, yet there is no sense of, of oneness or what we would typically consider to be kind of like that sensationalized experience of samadhi. There is just simply stillness. Um, I mean, that is also enough though, right? That, that is also useful in the process. Extremely useful. And, and these elevated states of super consciousness, many good things happen. Right. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> and we don't always we, know what they are. Right. Yes. Uh, we, we burn through karma. We eliminate subconscious tendencies and um, we change the structure, the literal physical structure of the brain via neuroplasticity. So we increase the size and the strength of the frontal lobes, which are associated with concentration, creativity, discernment, um, self-control, discipline, all good things for a yogi to have. Right. And uh, we begin to turn off the reptilian brain that is more associated with the lower chakras and base instincts and that sort of thing. And um, also during these elevated superconscious states, we can begin to see an inner light. We can <laughs> hear the uh, ohm vibration. Um, sometimes the brain will begin to produce uh, soma, which is this nectar that is produced um, in advanced meditators in the brain that converts into amrita or ambrosia in the, in the body. So many, many good things occur in these elevated superconscious states of, of stillness. Um, but you ask the question, is it enough? So mm -hmm. my question to you would be enough, enough for what? <laughs> well, the reason I ask that is because uh, oftentimes when I'm interacting with people who are meditating, they may experience this, this point of stillness, um, but because it's not some kind of mind-blowing um, samadhi like Yogananda would describe, uh, they, don't, they, they think that either they're failing or they think that, uh, you know, well, well, obviously it's not working. Um, and oh, I see. you see what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Yes, uh, I deal with the same thing with uh, my meditation students. Um, I always tell them, look, samadhi, you have to be realistic. You know, you have to, sometimes I think of my role in, in some of these things is like, have you ever seen that show Mythbusters? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I kind, of, I kind of think of myself as like this... Uh, is, is a myth buster sometimes samadhi is very rare mm -hmm. like very few people experience samadhi and there are various levels of samadhi we should we should go ahead and say that i mean uh it's not one thing you know there's uh, for example sabi kalpa samadhi nervi kalpa samadhi kalbaya and, and all this okay so there there's various levels or stages of of samadhi that one can experience however all of those stages are rare Mm -hmm. They're very rare experiences for meditators. Uh, even people that have been meditating for many years, I talk to people sometimes that say, I've been meditating for 40 years. I've never had a single experience of samadhi. And you know what? I have the utmost respect for uh, those people. to tell Because the they're still doing it. <laughs> yeah. They have, <laughs> the, they have the discipline and they're still spiritually hungry. Right. You know, and then I talk to other people who meditate for a few months and maybe have some profound experience and they think they've got it all figured out and they stop meditating and then they revert back to old habits and old patterns and things like that. So <laughs> what's more useful, you know, right. the, 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 the mind blowing Samadhi experience early on mm -hmm. or the person who is experiencing elevated super conscious states on an almost daily basis for 40 years. Mm -hmm. I don't know the, I don't necessarily know the answer to that. It's, right. it's more, it's, I will say this though, it's far more complicated than people think. Yes. This whole process. Right. Well, that, that leads, I think, um, into the, the next sutra that, that you had chosen, which is uh, from chapter one, uh, sutra 21 of the, of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, where it says, for one whose progress is fast 
and whose progress is intensive, samadhi is near. And, and I've, I've, I've been drawn to the sutra a lot too um, because I think what people really need to kind of get a sense of is what that word intensive means, right? Mm. So from your perspective, you, know, you chose this sutra. What about this sutra? Um, what about the sutra really speaks to you about what is required for this, this meditation process in Kriya Yoga? Okay, well, intensive for me implies that one is spiritually hungry. Mm -hmm. And so there has to be a certain spiritual appetite, almost a desperation. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, they, the sages say there are typically two ways that one is led to meditation or the spiritual path, either a, a profound longing for the divine mm -hmm. or really intense suffering. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that my path was probably a mixture, sort of a combination of both. But uh, and I think it probably is for most people. So I don't necessarily think it's one or the other. Right. However, I will say that intense suffering is really useful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> really useful for someone on a spiritual path. It's um, very utilitarian suffering. <laughs> and so, um, because, because it creates a, a, a spiritual hunger, you, you wish to escape uh, your suffering, which, and I have to qualify this, that's not a, a very good motivation. <laughs> Right. To tell you the truth, because it's a very selfish motivation, but we, we discover that later on, typically. So if that is the catalyst for someone to begin meditating, that's okay. That's perfectly fine. However, you know, further along the way, you realize, oh, well, that's actually a very sort of selfish uh, motivation. But anyway, so intensive to me means that you're spiritually hungry and you're willing to um, commit to the discipline necessary to attain your spiritual goals. Mm -hmm. and, and you can get down in, into to sadhana, you know, as far as like um, du the duration of your sadhana. And so uh, Yogananda used to talk about this. Uh, Mr. Davis used to talk about this. I've heard you discuss this and so you know you can have like sort of a beginner's level and an intermediate level and an advanced level of sadhana and typically we could say well maybe a beginner's level is 20 minutes a day of meditation intermediate might be i don't know 35 40 minutes and then an advanced meditator might be meditating for an hour or more at a time and and then you can even say well Maybe once a day isn't enough. Maybe once a day is not intensive, actually. Mm -hmm. And we need to me be meditating two or three times a day, actually, um, right. to really purify all this stuff that needs to get purified and to calm all the vrittis, to minimize all the vrittis so that we can probe the deeper layers of our being. Mm -hmm. well, how do you balance that with, <clears throat> I remember one time uh, when I was first getting involved in, in uh Kriya Yoga, and it's probably, I don't know, two years in, uh, you know, you read all these stories uh, in Autobiography of Yogi of people meditating, you know, six, eight hours at a, at a time all night long. And, and I used to think, oh, I have to do that. You know, if, I, if I'm not doing that, then I'm really not practicing intensive. And I, I remember it would give me headaches and I wouldn't be able to sleep. And Mr. Davis said to me, you need to meditate for shorter periods of time <laughs> and not give yourself a headache. <laughs> yeah. So, so where's that balance between, you know, that drive, but also recognizing, you, you know, we all might, you know, when I first got started, I could, I could barely meditate for longer than 20 minutes, but after 20 years, well, a couple hours is really nothing. So how does one that's just getting into it, how do they balance that, that desire with the realistic of, of kind of growing into a, a more intensive practice? Well, I probably have a fairly extreme take on it. I, I think one should be... You seem pretty... like an extreme guy. 
<laughs> but I anyway, think one should be should we, should be ready and willing to sacrifice it all for God. However, in a more practical sense, because we work with people that live in you know the real world and have duties, responsibilities, family, career, children, etc. Uh, so we have to be more practical about this. And what I typically recommend to people is meditating twice a day. And I usually start them off with 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening. Mm -hmm. Seems like a pretty good number. And a lot of the studies, uh, you know, the neurological studies show that um, we need to meditate for a minimum of 15 minutes to really um, activate the parts of the brain that we need to activate and deactivate uh, the parts of the brain that we need to deactivate and so on and so forth it takes about mm -hmm. 15 minutes typically to get to that stage. So 20 minutes seems to be a pretty good number. And so, yeah, I typically recommend that, that folks uh, meditate 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening and go about their day and, and uh, go about their normal interactions and activities and whatnot. But if somebody's really, really hungry and really wants to go for it, I, I don't see any problem with, going to live in an ashram or monastery or whatever. I mean, the people do that. People do that every day, all the time. I, I don't, it, it's, it's in the Western world. Uh, unfortunately, there's still a little bit of a stigma associated with people that go off to live in a monastery or an ashram. Like they are lazy somehow. Right. Um, <laughs> And so it's associated with laziness. Oh, this guy, he just goes and sits around all day and <laughs> he doesn't work. He's not, he's not a productive member of society. You know? uh -huh. That sort of thing. Uh, but I, don't, I see no problem with going off to, to live in a monastery, an ashram. If you feel called to do so, why not? Well, that's essentially what you've done, right? Moving down to Chile with your, with your yurt and your mountains, right? <laughs> um, or we no. I... A, we actually work a lot. Um, more I didn't mean I to say you were lazy. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I, in some senses, I, I definitely am. But no, we, we actually work a lot more than I would than I would like. My wife's a real go getter. Yeah. And uh, she, you know, if you know anything about Ayurveda, she's full on Pitta. And, <laughs> um, pitta Pitta. So like she, she really loves to work. She's a little bit of a workaholic, which is good for me um because it motivates me to work more and so we do end up working a lot but i think in the next few years um things will slow down i have to say though that when i first met mr davis i was a school teacher and i had my summers off so i would have about two and a half months uh of every year off free you know vacation time right and mr davis you know at, at csa they would offer um, several, um, sorry, my phone's ringing. It's okay. They would offer several meditation retreats every summer. And so for a few summers there, it was just like, okay, well, instead of going to the beach or the mountains or whatever, traveling, I'm just going to go to all these meditation retreats, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, I would spend, you know, four weeks, five weeks out of every summer or whatever it was, uh, in retreat. And so I highly me recommend meditation retreats, uh, even for people that have a lot of responsibilities and career and that sort of thing. Um, that's all well and good, but you should take the time out each year to uh, experience a, a retreat because during a retreat, you can, your, your practice can become much more intensive, going back mm -hmm. to that word. Right. And you have the time to really dive deep and to really probe the deeper layers of your being without so many distractions around. And the great thing about CSA that I used to love, I don't know if it's still this way, but um, there used to be no cell phone signal there. Yeah, there's very, it's very spotty. So yes, there's, okay. it's hard to get a cell phone signal. That is for sure. Oh, it was wonderful, you know, because you could just totally disconnect uh, from all of that. That, that's a problem I'm, I'm seeing a lot now is um, everybody's just on their devices all day long. And so they think they don't have time to meditate. But, you know, if you put, put down that phone for a little while each day, I think you would find you have an inordinate amount of time for meditation. Right. Yeah, well, there are numerous, you know, um, numerous 
uh, what do you call them? Luxuries, you know, technological luxuries that we have that, that they actually open up so much time for us that if we would really recognize that, I mean, we could have an hour, two hours a day just to sit and you know, read the Bhagavad Gita or you know, read a book on meditation or to meditate more. I mean, it, it's there. It's, it's just kind of trying to get people away from addiction to having their, their senses stimulated all the time. Yes. Exactly. But that's also, that's also the good thing about the retreats, as you're, as you're mentioning, is that if you do it for long enough, you know, I think a week can be good or, or longer is even better. Um, that gives you some time to kind of go through the withdrawal of all the stimulation that, that you did have, right? Because yes. you know, a lot of people, even when, they, even when they meditate, when they sit down to meditate, they're spending the first you know, 10 to 15 minutes just letting go of all the things that are going on in their life. And it's once they get to that 15 minute, 20 minute mark that if they're doing it well, that's then they actually start to experience that sort of tranquility of the process. So with meditation, with retreats, you know, why you don't want to give yourself a headache or get yourself fired from your job, you do want to do enough such that, you you're able to access that state and i think that takes time mm -hmm. yeah yes time yeah that's another myth you know that um there's a lot of teachers out there gurus that say you don't you don't even need to meditate and that we shouldn't think in terms of time right and uh it's you don't need to practice over a long period of time to attain enlightenment or elevated states of consciousness which Maybe that, and, and, and that is certainly true for some rare souls, you know. Yeah, for two of them. <laughs> yeah, right. Like <laughs> Ramana, Maharishi, a couple others, right? Um, yeah. However, for the rest of us, yeah, it's necessary to practice. And it does take time because we, once you begin to understand uh, neuroplasticity and the, and the changes in the brain and nervous system that need to occur in order to um, elevate your consciousness to certain stages of super consciousness and samadhi you realize oh well these changes physiological changes take time you know one of the things i love to tell my students is that enlightenment is a physiological process and you just see their eyes sort of glaze over and like this look of shock and like bewilderment on their faces. How could enlightenment be a, because we, we always think of it as something energetic, you know, Kundalini chakras, nadis, blah, blah, blah. But really it, it, in large part, I'll say not completely in large part, it is a, a physiological process that has to occur. Right. Well, I mean, it's a very, it's a very good point. And, you know, even Ramana Maharshi, who did have uh, an early childhood awakening experience, you know, when, when you read his talks, the talks with Ramana Maharshi, um, you know, he doesn't just tell people, hey, you know, you don't need to do anything. If someone, if someone needs to practice a mantra, if someone needs some kind of supportive process, you know, he, he had the sense enough to say, all right, well, Right now, you might not be able to recognize the truth of your nature, so it's perfectly okay for you to go ahead and do this this mantra with devotion and do your meditation practice with devotion to realize to to become aware of that. And a lot of the people that I've seen, you know, in the current um, spiritual economy that seem to promote just be there now and that's all you right. need you know they have they have a, a profound experience and then that seems to be all that happens and then that's what they're sharing and and happily i, I do have to say there was at least one teacher that i was aware of that i had I'd met in Asheville uh, a few times that he was a young guy and of course he was had some experience and was running around talking nonsense and mm -hmm. acting like you don't have to do anything to experience it and give me your money while you're at it and I'll be happy. <laughs> um, but I actually saw one of, one of his talks. Um, uh, I don't know why I clicked on it just to see what he was talking about now. And he was now saying, Oh, well, practice can actually be good for you. <laughs> so I thought to myself, finally. So, you know, as, as you describe, you know, time, it's not necessarily, that we want to get over fixated on time. I think it's more just the recognition that, you know, we are just like 
plants and animals and physical things. We are growing and we are maturing and we are growing through this human experience and that that might take time and it's okay to do things that help to support that along the way. Just like maybe eating more fruits and vegetables can help to support you to be as healthy as you possibly can be, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, sure. anyway, <clears throat> um, so looking at, you know, the list of sutras that we have here, the next one you picked, um, I particularly like this one as well. Uh, it's Sutra 28 where you say, one should vocally and mentally chant Om, or potentially says, one should vocally and mentally chant Om, attentively listen to it, meditatively contemplate it, comprehend its real nature and identify with it. And we, we talked about in meditation how um, once you start to access those states of clarity and stillness, it is possible to see an inner light in the frontal regions of the brain, the spiritual eye center, as it's called. It's possible to hear that OM vibration, which again, one of my first experiences with that was after a Kree initiation at CSA, just the stillness, the stillness that, that, that happened after that allowed this OM vibration to, to come forward. Um, so with this sutra, uh, you know, there's, there's so much that can be said about, you know, Lahiri Masaya, he, he talks about how uh, the Om Kar Kriya, or learning to hear the Om vibration, he, he describes the body itself as a, a manifestation of Om, and such that even by paying attention to the body and the vibration of the body, that can lead to this, this understanding, this feeling of Om. So with this amazingly, what I consider to be complex and deep sutra, how does it speak to you and, and what would you like you know, people who are practicing meditation in Kriya to understand about the sutra such that they can process the path with more grace? Sure. Well, many of the ancient yogic texts speak of the Om technique of meditation, which they refer to as Nada Yoga, usually, <laughs> or sometimes Shabda Yoga, as the highest technique of Dharana. Dharana is uh, concentration. It's the sixth step in the eight steps of Patanjali. And it's a preliminary step before we enter into jhana, which is super conscious meditation, which is a thought free, clear state, mostly thought free, typically. And so most of the, the texts describe Nada yoga or Shabda yoga as the highest and um, most advanced technique of dharana or concentration that we can use to concentrate and focus the mind and and om is essentially the substratum of all of manifestation even more subtle than the anandamaya kosha so we have these five koshas each kosha is less and less dense has a less dense frequency mm -hmm. But even below Ananda Maya Kosha, which is the least dense of all the layers of our being, exists the Om vibration. So it's the most subtle vibratory phenomenon in the universe. And it's, I had a, a great meditation, meditation teacher, Graham Fowler, who I took a, a course on Shabda Yoga with some years ago. And he told me, he was a student of Maharishi Mashyogi. And he told me that the own vibration is the closest we can get to God within the manifest realm. Hmm. So I loved, uh, I loved the way he described it. Hmm. And so essentially, uh, we can use this technique of Nada Yoga or Shabda Yoga or Omkar Kriya in the Kriya tradition to focus our attention and awareness on a subtle vibration occurring in and around the head. We start off with that. And usually it's a, a physical sound. Um, the sound of electrical signals in the brain or the flow of blood in the, in the head and brain. And we can listen, we can actually hear that. And so we completely focus our attention, unite our attention fully with that sound. And then after uh, usually a few minutes, we begin to search for an even more subtle sound frequency and so on and so forth for the entire duration of our meditation so that we're constantly searching for a deeper layer or a more subtle and refined 
frequency or vibration. And eventually we can hear uh, or experience is probably a better word, experience the subtle vibration of ohm and unite our attention fully with that. <clears throat> and it's just a wonderful technique to use when we're meditating. It's actually the primary technique that I now teach. Um, I teach the Kriya techniques, but then, you know, after you perform the pranayama techniques, I, I now primarily teach Shabda yoga or Omkar. And, and we actually use uh, noise canceling headphones um, with my students so that they can really hear the subtle and refined frequencies more clearly. Mm -hmm. And so, or you can use earplugs, headphones, whatever you need, but it's a really highly effective technique. Right. <clears throat> so, you know, there's a few things I'm curious about that. You know, in this particular sutra, it talks about um, vocally chanting Om and, and mentally chanting Om. Uh, what, what role does that play related to actually being able to have the experience uh, to listen, to hear Om, the Om vibration? Well, Sanskrit chanting in general is very useful to do um, because it quiets and stills the mind. These Sanskrit syllables have a, a very specific effect on our being, on all the layers of our being. And whenever we do chant Om or whatever Sanskrit mantra, it's very important to try and feel our entire body vibrating and especially the spine and the vertebrae because we have our Shashumna Nadi along the physical spine. It's sort of our astral spine, if you want to think of it that way. And it connects all of the chakras. And in the yoga tradition, we say that we... Um, we, we uh, have our karma in the chakras. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we carry our baggage within the, within the chakras. And so if we can vibrate the spine and vibrate the Shashumna Nadi, we can actually you know, clean and purify the chakras. You can think of like a guitar string that is dusty and this guitar string is full of dust. And when you pluck it and vibrate the string, all of the dust flies off, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do we clean the guitar string? We, we vibrate the guitar string so that all, the, all of the dust flies away. Well, we can think of that same analogy for the physical spine, the astral spine, so that when we chant Sanskrit mantras, especially Om, we want to ideally feel our body vibrating and, and the spine vibrating so that we can purify and clear some of the karma and samskaras that is present within the, the chakras. So it's a great preliminary kriya or action that we can do to prepare for meditation. Right. And the, I mean, the use of the, the kriya pranayama itself, uh, you know, that helps to kind of, cast off this this dust on the string if you will um yes. i mean that, that's one of the reasons why doing the kriya pranayama as well as doing uh, jyoti mudra uh, those are really wonderful ways of kind of internalizing attention such that you're able to hear the own vibration more clearly correct yes absolutely um kriya pranayama where we um move the prana through the Shashumna Nadi with the breath is also very purifying mm -hmm. and cleansing for karma, samskaras, is probably even more so than chanting Om or chanting in general. The problem with Kriya Pranayama, not, it's not a problem, I shouldn't say that. The issue with Kriya Pranayama is that oftentimes it requires several months of constant disciplined practice to open the Shashumna Nadi. And I, I, I think that's one of the reasons that many people who are initiated into Kriya do not continue with the practice because they are unable to feel the effects, the energetic effects of Kriya Pranayama 
But then there's Shashumna Nadi because the Shashumna Nadi is typically closed in most people, the vast majority. And so what most people don't understand is that typically it requires months of Kriya Pranayama practice to actually begin to open the Shashumna Nadi and to literally increase the size and circumference and diameter of the Shashumna Nadi so that prana can more easily flow up to the higher chakras. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so by kind of focusing on uh, chanting Om and contemplating Om, that's also a supplementary technique to just assist, assist that process, to help bring people's attention to the areas that need worked on. Yes, definitely. Okay, okay. And where, so I'm assuming you put that towards the end of your, when you recommend meditation, you, you tend to put that towards the end of the meditation procedure, or, or where does that fit in in regards to, say, like a, a schedule or a routine? That's a great question. A lot of people prefer to chant before they meditate. I've always preferred to chant after. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> why, but yeah. I typically chant. Um, I have a chanting practice that I do after I finish meditating at the very end of, of my session in my sadhana, because I can, I, I find that after I meditate, I'm far more sensitive to subtle energies and frequencies. Mm -hmm. And so I can feel the effects of the mantras and the chanting far more right. after I meditate. And there, but there are other people that, that love to chant before they meditate because it calms the mind and gets them in a more devotional state. So I think people just need to experiment. There's no one size fits all sadhana, that's for sure. Well, yeah, you bring up a good point there. And I think this is something that uh, a lot of people either mistake or, or look over or just don't believe that they have the capacity to you know, make a decision on their own. And that is, you know, with this whole process, um, it, it needs to be something that that you can get into, that you can participate in, that you can feel, that you can have a response from and you know whereas one person learning a musical instrument might need might need to have a practice schedule that's different than another's you know it's okay if you find that uh, chanting after you meditate really helps bring it home for you you know or if doing alternate nostril breathing before you meditate that's a wonderful way to calm the mind you know there are certain procedures obviously that we follow but you know we are all individuals and what you've just illustrated is that we need to pay attention to how do we respond to the practices and trust that we can as long as we're not completely rearranging everything we can actually make choices uh, within our own practice such that our meditations have a greater effect and a greater impact in the time that we have to, you know, to practice them. That's right. That's absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when we think about this idea of OM being the, I, I, you mentioned that OM being the aspect of the divine as close to the idea of pure divinity or, or I'm not sure exactly the word you use, but, uh, the own vibration allows us to experience that this side of manifestation as in, you know, the rise and fall of things. Um, and, you know, looking at that next sutra, which the primary cause of suffering is a mistaken self identity. And we are jumping from chapter one all the way up to chapter two. However, I think that by contemplating Om, you know, as we get closer to that understanding of the wholeness of life, God, divinity, um, we tend to not have such a mistaken sense of self-identity. You know, we tend to um, see other people's manifestations of ourselves. So we, we tend to treat them better. We tend to understand that we are connected to everything on the planet. And so we tend to treat the planet better. Um, <clears throat> this idea of the primary cause of suffering is mistaken self-identity. Um, how do we take something like this esoteric principle of contemplating the ohm vibration and translate it uh, into maybe more practical, down-to-earth, everyday living, um, everyday living approach to recognizing, well, what am I? You know, how, how do we how do we make this jump from these esoteric things to not having a mistaken sense of self-identity while we are playing the role that we're meant to play in this world. Yeah, I think that's what I mean to ask. Um, 
Geez, if I had an answer to that, man, I think, uh, <laughs> I think I'd have it all figured out. You know? um, <laughs> that's what I struggle with as far as like down to earth, practical application. That's, that might be my, my challenge for this uh, incarnation, but. Right. Um, well, what is, although, although I do, I do better than, than I used to, but yeah. So I love the question. Essentially we use whatever technique we need to get us to a stage of super consciousness. So maybe you like to listen to Om, maybe you like to repeat a mantra, maybe you just like to observe the breath, and maybe you visualize a sacred form or yantra. Um, these are all different techniques of dharana that we can implement to get us to jhana, which is the super conscious meditative state or transcendental meditative state. Mm -hmm. And so in this super conscious state, we experience ourselves as the observer or witness without anything to observe. So we are the observer without its observations. And we can experience that, um, well, if, if we can observe the mind, we can observe the contents of the mind, we can observe the body, we can observe the personality and so on and so forth. Obviously we are not any of these things that we observe. We are the observer in fact. And what is this observer? Supreme, consciousness or what um, Patanjali describes or defines as unbounded consciousness, which, yeah. I, which I love. And so this verse says the primary cause of suffering is a mistaken sense of self-identity. In other words, you suffer because you are identified with the sufferer. Mm -hmm. You identify with the sufferer because of this great spell of Maya. And mm -hmm. so when you are identified with that which suffers, you will suffer. And so what we have to realize, and we begin to realize in super conscious states, even more so in Samadhi, is that we are not that which suffers. We are not the thing that suffers. We are the thing that observes the thing that suffers. Mm -hmm. And so when we begin to unify our attention and awareness more and more day by day, with the observer and the witness, supreme unbounded consciousness, we can observe the person that is suffering objectively without reaction, without participation, without identification, without judgment in a very calm, tranquil, objective manner. And so for me, that's what this, this verse signifies as far as then how do we bring that back into the world and how do we live as that observer well, that's the, that's the real trick, isn't it? Right. Um, practicing what the Buddhists refer to as mindfulness, although I don't particularly care for that term as much. I prefer like objective observation <laughs> instead of mindfulness. Um, but how, how do we live from this super conscious state of objective observation within the world and within our day-to-day -day activities and social interactions and so on and so forth? That's where the spiritual path gets really fun and really challenging. And um, I'm still trying to, to figure that all out as, as we all are, I guess. Well, what's the difficulty then? I mean, that's always the thing I'm curious about because, um, you know, we read these, these texts on spiritual topics. We have teachers telling us different things and we have our own practice. You know, I'm always curious um, what, you know, we were told, and, and you even mentioned early on, uh, that we, we need to kind of like sacrifice it all or, or give it all up, give it all up, you know, for, for this, this, uh, this ideal experience to dawn or, or realization to dawn. But then we get to the point where there's a, a suture like this, where it says the primary cause of suffering is a mistaken sense of self-identity, which in a way kind of implies, um, okay, well, if I'm living my life and I'm in this world and I'm not going to mistake myself as just this limited, you know, Ryan personality body and a situation arises where I can make a choice that's maybe, and, and this might be maybe an oversimplification, but I can make a choice that is the right choice, such as, you know, someone uh, needs something from me and knowing that I am, 
I'm not just this limited personality of body that, hey, I can, I can provide that or I can be a, a vehicle vessel through which that can be uh, realized or I can mistake myself and say, well, you know what, that's really not going to help this little Ryan out very much, so I'm, I'm not going to do that. But, but I'm a yogi and I'll figure it out eventually. <laughs> so um, where... where, where Davis always said that, you know, that we would, uh, when, when we are super conscious... When, or when we're more or less self-realized, we always do whatever's appropriate in every moment of every day. Right. And that has certainly been my experience when I'm in a good place spiritually. I just act appropriately. I, there, in other words, there is no choice. Right. However, when I'm more trapped inside this Chris thing, uh, I'm always choosing <laughs> and, and, and I'm not, <laughs> and I'm not always acting appropriately. I like that. Sure. And so, and so when when we are in this sort of elevated state from this this vantage point of the self with a capital S self, we tend to just act appropriately, and there, there's really no choice. We don't have to choose anything. It's it's a choiceless existence. Mm -hmm. However, once we become identified again with our limited temporary fleeting transient self uh, we tend to get trapped in the mind which mm -hmm. is uh, the realm of choices right and decisions and the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other you know um, however when we're in a really good place spiritually those those choices don't really exist it's it's a choiceless existence Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something to contemplate. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's a good. I, I like the way you, you put that. That there, there, there is no choice. And the reason I'm, I'm hesitating here is because th this can go in so many different philosophical uh, directions. And I know, you know, oftentimes when people listen to talks like this or discussions like this, that what comes up is this this difficulty with um, what's the word um, sort of like fate and free will. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, that brings up all kinds of things. So when we practice our meditation and when we do our, our Kriya practice and as, as realizations come and as we become clear, it sounds to me like what you're saying, and this kind of has been my experience too, is that, when life is happening, we're not necessarily overthinking it. Exactly. Well, there, there's no, there's no need. Right. Because you're, you're living from a place of divine inspiration. In other words, you're just sort of a pure channel. Well, channel is not a great word. conduit. Let's say you're a pure conduit for that divine presence in the world. Right. So there, there's no choices to be made. It's automatic. Uh, choices and decisions occur when we're not in that space and when we're not flowing, when we're not in the flow. You know, I, I studied uh, Eastern religions in college and um, my, my favorite text or two of my favorite texts at that time were the Tao Te Ching and Chuangsa, these Taoist texts. Mm -hmm. And the Tao is, you know, is sort of translated as the flow you know, and, uh, or the way, you know? Right. And so their, their whole philosophy is just like getting yourself lowercase s self out of the way so that you can just flow. Right. There's flow, there's Tao, there's flow, you know? And, and I'm sure as a musician, you find this too, when, uh, especially when you're improvising, when you're mm -hmm. soloing or playing lead, um, I find that once I get my mind out of the way, once I get Chris totally out of the way, my solos are so much better and right. my improvisations are so much clearer and, and juicier and more creative. Mm -hmm. well, you bring up some very good points, uh, especially we'll start with the one about the music. Um, and what I've been thinking about again, why, why I hesitate around this kind of topic is because, you know, over the years talking to people who are just getting in meditation or, or, or studying spirituality there is a lot of uh, anxiety about doing the right thing. 
And, you know, if we start saying things like, well, you just have to be in the flow. And if someone who isn't quite disciplined or ready decides they're going to be in the flow, oftentimes they do a lot of stupid shit. <laughs> mm, sure. And um, what I want to say first is that... Oh, well, there's a great... We should... Okay, so the flow that you're describing is what I would call sort of sleepwalking autopilot flow. Okay. You know, and so maybe we can distinguish between this sort of like autopilot ego flow, you know, versus a sort of higher state flow. Maybe. I, I'm not sure if that's what you're describing. Maybe you can... Well, yeah, I, I mean, there, there's, there's two lines of thought that I'm trying to pull together here. And one, we'll use the, the musician idea first, you know, in order to play a solo, you have to think about music first, meaning you have to actually learn to play your instrument. Yes. Then you can solo and you can turn off your mind and it can just come out beautifully. So the, the reason I like that example is because for individuals who are worried about doing the right thing or are worried about, oh my goodness, you mean I just have to, what, if I surrender, everything will fall apart. Well, what I would say is no, learn your scales, learn your techniques first, read the Yoga Sutras, contemplate truthfulness, non-possessiveness, um, brahmacharya, like do that because that's like learning the, 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 the principles of, of what's going to lead to the flow. And then as, as a person does that, as they start to practice meditation, then they start to have moments of where they recognize, oh, things are just flowing. And of course, they're going to go back into states of, oh, well, how do I repeat that? My mind is now trying to figure all this out. Well, as long as you keep moving forward with that, as long as you keep improving upon the fundamentals, eventually, I think people will reach what, what you are discussing about this, um, this place of flow. Bro, uh, I love it. I love where, it. Where, yeah, where it just happens natural. Because when I think about my life now compared to my life 20 years ago before I even started meditation, I was just a ball of anxiety and thoughts, just trying to figure everything out. But now, now all that needs to happen is get up, meditate, make breakfast, get to work. You know, things just, as you say, they flow. They just happen. Even when things go wrong, all right, well, we'll just, we'll, we'll respond to that however we can and we'll see what happens. Um, but the other thing that you mentioned uh, early on, you talked about uh, um, how your, your initial motivation or a lot of people's motivations, even mine, getting into meditation is kind of to escape pain or to deal with pain, right? Right. Well, it's been described to me one time in, in a very what I thought interesting way, the ideas of the gunas, uh, Thomas, Rajas, and Sattva. And, um, you know, in the, in the Yoga Sutras, part of the, the goal is to get a person to the sattvic kind of living state, which is the flow state, such that they can eventually transcend that too. But before we get to transcendence, sattva needs to be uh, kind of cultivated. And I'm, I'm tr trying to tie all this together, so bear with me. Um, with the tamasic state, it was described to me that when a person is, is acting out of tamas, it's because some problem is there and needs to be dealt with right now. So for example, your house is burning down, the tamasic reaction is to get up and run out. You know, it's not this idea of, oh, you're dark and you're heavy and you're bad. It's, you know, you're in pain. So you need to do something to get out of pain. That's like a tamasic motivation. Right. And, and then a rajasic motivation was described to me uh, Rajas was described to me as being like the, a, a mist and a Rajasic motivation is I have a choice. <laughs> right. and, and the mist is the, the mist is the false idea that you are an individual who's acting on its own behalf. So when a person starts meditation, they do it to get out of pain, Tamasic motivation, no problem. It's still getting them into meditation, but then they move into the stage where there's not a lot of pain, but what do they do now? Oh, I want to be self-realized because I want to better myself. I want to choose to be something greater. So that's like a rajasic motivation of making yourself better. And then sattva, that's where we get into the Bhagavad Gita and the idea of, um, you know, the yogi is entitled to action only, not the fruits of their action. So the yogi then meditates or lives its life in a healthy way um, just because that is the appropriate natural thing to do, not because it wants something, not because it wants to escape from something, just because then it is in that state of flow where the sattvic inspiration happens. And, and, and that doesn't have to be limited to my inspiration is simply 
I'm going to sit here and meditate. It could be, hey, my inspiration is to go start a business. I'm not doing it because I want to improve the world. I'm not doing it because I want to be better. It's just because that is the natural inspiration of flow of where my life is going right now. You see? Yes. I'll so anyway, know. anyway, you're, everything you described about uh, music and uh, it, it all just kind of came together. <laughs> no, I'm loving it. Um, yeah, I, I like the analogy of the music a lot. We, we always tell our students in uh, our vinyasa yoga trainings that because we have a very specific sequence of asanas or posture, postures that we teach and they have to um, teach a class at the end of the course in order to pass and get their diploma and certification and all that. And um, invariably, <laughs> every uh, group that we have, someone tries to start playing jazz in their class. You know? <laughs> right. and, and we always have to correct them and say, look, you know, you're learning the melody right now and mm -hmm. you need to focus on the melody. You have to learn the melody before you can play jazz. Right. So maybe that melody is reading the, the sacred texts often and, and studying from a teacher, you know, who is enlightened or at least semi-enlightened. Right. And um, so maybe that's, melody that we have to learn before we get into that flow state and we can just start playing jazz and get the, mm -hmm. the mind totally out of the way. So I really love that. And also, yeah, you know, you talked about, and I think maybe we've talked about this before or maybe someone else, but uh, you know, a lot of the more sort of mm, deeper experiences that I've had during meditation happened actually sort of earlier on the first few years I meditated. Now I just meditate because it just feels like the right thing to do. Right. Not because I'm seeking after some great revelation, realization or anything like that. It's just, and I talked to Mr. Davis about this too. And, and he said, yeah, you know, in the same way, I just, I, I continue to meditate because it just, it just seems like the appropriate thing for me to do. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that, that reminded me of a, of an, an experience with Mr. Davis too. And I remember it was, I don't know, I don't know when it was, but I remember I, I walked in one day to visit with him and we sat down and, you know, he was talking and sharing his stories and he got quiet a minute. And then I said, you know, the, the more I do this, you know, I look around and I, I just sort of had this feeling like this is it. Mm. And he looked around. He said, yep, pretty much. <laughs> yes. I love it. Yeah. yeah, pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. All right. Well, I'm looking over, you know, some of these other sutras that we had, we had picked out or you had picked out to discuss. And I, I think that, um, they might take us into a, a few more hours worth of discussion. So we might need to save those for another time. <laughs> Super. Yeah. But I think we ended on, on, on a wonderful uh, note to conclude on. So absolutely. Um, I really want to thank you for taking the time uh, to, to speak with me and, you know, share your experience and, and, and share you know, your thoughts on these sutras. And uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime. Anytime. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This episode of the Kriya Yoga podcast was made possible by donations from Kriya Yoga apprenticeship students and supporters of our Patreon community at www.patreon.com forward slash Kriya Yoga.